So we've looked at how all of these advanced or more advanced industrial materials, steel, glass, concrete, um, have come together in a couple of different ways. We looked at uh, first couple generations of tall buildings, skyscrapers, uh, through the 1890s through about the 1920s. Uh, and we also looked at long spans, so two kind of structural achievements uh, that, that, that we tend to measure uh, the, the state of building technology by, right? How tall something is or how long something spans. We also looked a little bit at curtain walls, how new materials came together to forge new, what we might call construction typologies, ways of thinking not just about whole buildings, but about building components and systems. And in this lecture, I want to look at how the, the skyscraper evolved in the 20th century, particularly after World War II, when a lot of the same materials that architects and builders worked with uh, in the early 20th century were still there, still being used, um, but put to slightly more efficient or slightly more effective ends. Uh, some of this came about through advances in materials, as we'll see. Uh, a lot more of it came about through advances in design and particularly better techniques for uh, engineering uh, tall buildings, right? Ways to make them uh, use their material more effectively to reduce weight and especially uh, to resist wind uh, as, as buildings went taller and taller. The evolution of the skyscraper in the 20th century uh, is one that uh, tracked out pretty slowly. Uh, because of the Great Depression, because of World War II, there was really this long break, particularly in, in North American construction, between about 1934, when you see the field building in Chicago on the left, uh, and the Prudential building 1953-54, also in Chicago uh, in the middle. But even those, uh, were represented a, a kind of slow progression, right? If you, you look at the skin of the Prudential building, it's very similar in a lot of ways to the skin of the field building. We talked about why that was, that even though there were new technologies that had come online, things like building codes were sort of slow to adapt uh, to, to those advances. Getting to what we think of as the modern skyscraper, the glass box was partly uh, due to advances in curtain walls. We looked at those, but as we'll see in this lecture, it also had a lot to do with the way that structure, building structure, uh, was reconsidered by engineers, by architects, uh, and how structure and skin together forged a kind of new aesthetic, right? The glass box comes out of the synthesis between new advances in skins and new advances in structure. We looked a little bit at some of the uh, technical advances that occurred in the 1930s, even though tall building construction especially may have ground to a halt during the Great Depression, uh, research and development did not. And three that in particular affected uh, the way that uh, curtain walls were made to clad buildings were air conditioning, which allowed for larger panes of glass. Fluorescent lighting, which made illumination of office interiors uh, even cheaper than it had been with incandescence uh, and allowed for uh, larger floor plates, more, uh, more uh, spread out planning. And then we looked at extensively at, at glass, right, and the advances in glass that uh, made the, the, the glass curtain wall such an effective and, and economical uh, way to, to clad buildings. I want to look briefly at the effect of these two, of air conditioning and fluorescent lighting, because they really changed the way that, that tall buildings were massed. Um, in the, the Scientific American article on the left, you see the Milam building in San Antonio, Texas, which is kind of regarded as the first complete installation of air conditioning in a commercial building, at least a tall commercial building. And you might notice that the Milam doesn't look much different than some of the buildings that we looked at that weren't air conditioned, right, that were naturally ventilated. Uh, the Milam has small windows. It has uh, an, a light court or an air court, we might call it, that faces out. And so that we, as we talked about, allowed for natural ventilation. And the Milam building was really transitional. It had an air conditioning system, but it was also naturally ventilated when the, when the weather was, was decent out. Only when the San Antonio summers got really, really hot uh, was the building sealed up and the air conditioning uh, equipment turned on. So the Milam didn't fully take advantage of the, the kind of architectural effect uh, that, that air conditioning uh, would have allowed. 
Where we get kind of the, the much bigger floor plates uh, in, in the post-war era, um, it comes from a combination of air conditioning, which means that you can move uh, offices away from windows or workspaces away from windows. You no longer need uh, the natural ventilation, so you can get much deeper plans. Uh, and fluorescent lighting, which makes it economical uh, to illuminate large you know, acreage of, of offices uh, with, a, with a kind of systematic approach. Fluorescent lighting, because uh, it was uh, manufactured in linear units, um, gave this kind of uh, uh, even illumination over desks that was also linear. Right? The, the measure of the, the intensity of the light um, uh, would decrease as you got away from the, the line of the fluorescent uh, uh, luminaire. And so you see in the drawings showing how offices in the post-war era should best be laid out in the center and on the right, uh, that these really implied kind of linear arrangements of offices. Um, fluorescent lighting, because it could be uh, installed in uh, luminaires that had plastic diffusers and aluminum reflectors, uh, meant that you could be very scientific about where you were actually putting the light uh, on work surfaces. And as a result, uh, it became much more economical, much more affordable to, to lay out larger and larger open office systems that took advantage of that spread of light and at the same time took advantage of the fact that air conditioning could be ducted uh, to any point in the building. So you go from seeing those uh, tall buildings that are wrapped around light courts or air courts, uh, as we called them, to floor plans like the, the one on the, on the right, which is sort of a generic um, illustration of, of how to lay out a ceiling. And that really jibes with the layout of offices increasingly in these open plan uh, sort of uh, mass, uh, mass workspaces. We can see this uh, even in buildings like the Prudential, right, where we talked about the skin being a relatively conservative one, um, but the planning, the floor plan of the Prudential uh, can only happen with air conditioning and fluorescent lighting. Um, here you see the, the floor plans on the right, and Prudential uh, rented out the top uh, 30 or, sto or so stories of the building. That was all speculative. And so those are relatively narrow floor plates that uh, offer lots of windows that are attractive to, uh, to potential tenants. But even so, the, the thinnest part of that slab is still 75 feet deep, which is deeper even than any of the, the naturally ventilated skyscrapers we looked at uh, a couple of lectures ago. On the lower floors where Prudential, uh, an insurance company, had its own offices, uh, it employed hundreds of telephone operators. That was the way you got in touch with uh, your insurance company if something went wrong. And so they have these hundreds of telephone operators. They need to give them all the same level of illumination, uh, the same level of artificial uh, ventilation. And so you can see in the lighter shade, that is a floor plan for Prudential's offices. And that, as you can see, is much, much deeper, right? Lots more people, much farther away from windows. Prudential doesn't have to worry about the attractiveness of the office. They're not leasing it out to tenants. They're simply providing it uh, for their employees. And this is only possible, again, with advances in fluorescent lighting uh, and air conditioning that allow you to spread those out uh, over a very, very large floor area. We talked about the Prudential as being this kind of very advanced building in some ways, but also very conservative uh, in others. Uh, it looked back to the field building, to Rockefeller Center. You can see in the, the drawing on the right, the elevation drawing, that it still has these vertical stone uh, facade panels and these relatively small windows, right? Not the, not the glass box at all. Prudential came in uh, after some of these more progressive building codes, and it reflects really a kind of conservative outlook on the on the part of its uh, on the part of its architects and on the part of the client there were other more progressive views though about how skyscrapers in particular uh, could take advantage not only uh, economically of new materials and new techniques uh, but also stylistically right how um, newly affordable glass especially once float glass comes into play in the late 60s uh, but also new uh, techniques of curtain walling and new structural techniques could forge really a kind of new aesthetic, one that was more appropriate to uh, the technological climate uh, in which these buildings found themselves.
And really, one of the leading uh, figures in this was Mies van der Rohe, who we've looked at, who was the, the kind of um, pioneering figure of the so-called glass skyscraper with his speculative projects in the early 1920s. Um, Mies comes to Chicago in 1937. He's a refugee from the, the, the Nazi uh, ascension in Germany. Uh, and he ends up at the Armour Institute, which becomes the Illinois Institute of Technology. We talked about how Mies designed all the buildings for the new campus that IIT built, uh, and how at the same time he began a career as a skyscraper architect. His first tall building that he actually got built was Promontory Apartments in 1949. Mies uh, was not only a, a, an architect, but he was also a, a, a theorist. And one of his great beliefs was that architecture was an expression of the kind of uh, technology, technological culture uh, of the time. And he thought of architecture, as you can see here, as the kind of ultimate expression of technology. Uh, looked around him and saw the kind of conservative, more uh, solid, more kind of backwards looking buildings going up. Uh, and, and in his own mind, began to formulate ways to think about uh, all of these new technologies coming together and, and forging something new. In Chicago, uh, he of course is surrounded by buildings by uh, Louis Sullivan, uh, some of the classic uh, Chicago school architecture like, uh, like the, the Reliance building. Um, and this is a, an, an environment in which this idea feels very comfortable that architecture should sort of be plain spoken about the things that make it stand up, the things that, that make it work. Mies put these ideas into practice not only in his office, but also in the school. And IIT really became a laboratory not only for new structural techniques, new constructive techniques, but also the architectural impact of, of what those might be. And so you see here uh, student work, graduate work, thesis work uh, done uh, sometimes under Mises' supervision, sometimes under uh, kind of Mies' disciples' supervision. And, and you can see that they are all employing what we might loosely call Miesian techniques, exposed structure, very minimalist detailing for curtain walls in ways that will be influential. IIT serves as a, a real laboratory for uh, long span and skyscraper architecture, not just in Chicago, uh, but, but throughout, the, throughout the world and even throughout the country. Meanwhile, as we saw, Mies is coping with uh, a building culture that is not quite up to the, the, the technology that he's seeing. We looked at Promontory in particular, noted that it, it couldn't be steel, uh, that it was concrete because of uh, ongoing uh, uh, production issues after World War II, um, but also concrete being a, a maybe a more appropriate material for residential construction. It allowed for thinner slabs uh, than, than the deep uh, steelwork that was more appropriate for commercial construction. We also talked promont about promontory in relation to the building code that Chicago had at the time, the, the kind of uh, prescriptive code that said you needed these upstand walls that limited the amount of glass that, that Mies could deploy. His most famous skyscrapers, uh, 86880 Lakeshore Drive, done shortly thereafter, uh, and in fact, permitted right after uh, the, the, the new code comes into effect, um, show the potential for the so-called glass box. And we talked a great deal about um, how the, the, the code suddenly allowed uh, for larger panes of glass. And Mies detailed these not only for the aesthetics, but also for the economics, right? That it's much cheaper to hire workers to lay in the aluminum framed windows from the inside than to actually lay the brickwork that was required for, for spandrel walls. A6880 proved profoundly influential, um, but they were real anomalies. Uh, we talked about the fact that they weren't uh, air conditioned, although lots of residents came in and retrofit uh, air conditioners into the, into the curtain wall after they moved in, but they were also steel framed and steel was very unusual, still is very unusual uh, for residential construction. And that has to do with the way that the buildings are serviced, the way that, uh, that, that air is supplied to, to apartments. Um, because apartments are usually carved up into discrete rooms, as you see here in the, in the uh, plans of uh, 86880, um, they don't require the kind of flexibility that commercial construction does. The large open floor plates of Prudential, say, 
uh, led architects to develop ceilings that had a lot of space in them where ductwork could be uh, not only installed but also rearranged as office needs changed. In apartments, because they tend to be much shallower, uh, most cities have codes that require, for instance, all occupied rooms to have access to, to daylight. Um, there's usually either natural ventilation uh, or some way of bringing in air through the skin instead of ducting it from a, from a central core. And what this means is that there's no need for the kind of deep open web trusses that most steel skyscrapers used uh, to support their floors. The open web trusses allow ductwork to kind of snake wherever it needs to go on the floor. It's much more effective in uh, residential construction to build with flat slabs of the sort that Robert Mayart and uh, Cap Turner developed in the early part of the, of the century. 86880 were steel in large part because the steel industry subsidized the material for the project. They wanted a demonstration project that showed the feasibility of using steel in what they knew was going to be a big market in the demographic boom after World War II, but frankly it never caught on. And in fact, when Mies had the opportunity to build literally right across the street a few years later, uh, another set of apartments for the same developer. Um, several things changed. Uh, firstly, Mies switched from steel to concrete, and the so-called Esplanade Apartments, 900, 910 Lakeshore Drive, um, are just as tall as 86880, but because they use flat slab construction instead of deep steel construction, they have three more floors of apartment in the same height. So they're able to sell or rent out many, many more units, and therefore, Concrete actually proves itself over steel uh, as, 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 a, as a residential building material. You can see too that the uh, prepackaged cladding units that are about to go on the building there in the center are now aluminum, uh, not steel. The, the cladding for 86880 is steel. The cladding for the buildings across the street a few years later are aluminum. I think that kind of very neatly marks the shift that we talked about in materials for curtain walls. And you can see in the detail too that 900, 910 was in fact air conditioned, that fan coil units were installed at the periphery of the building where they could throw de um, uh, dehumidified air uh, up against the interior of these, uh, of these windows and take care of both the condensation problem and by blanketing the, the windows with hot or cold air depending on the season also provide a little bit of an insulating barrier. That does an interesting thing, right? In 86880, the cladding and the structure both occupy the same plane, basically. The, the cladding, the mullions stick out a little bit, but the windows are flush with the edge of the, of the columns. In 900-910, Mies has to get hot or cold water up to these fan coil units, and there's no way to do this in a flat slab from a, from a core. So he actually brings them up the exterior of the building in a zone between the concrete columns and the aluminum cladding. Uh, and that, as you can see here in the, uh, in the diagram, that is an insulated pipe that brings hot or cold water up to that fan coil unit. And what that does is it creates a, a, a gap, right? It separates the cladding from the structure in a way that has made the building in a lot of critics' eyes less expressive, right? All you see is the rhythm of the cladding. You don't really get a sense for where the, the columns are. The columns are sort of buried now behind this zone. Um, but it's a, a more effective way of integrating all of the building systems, that there is an air conditioning or heating system that's built into the building uh, and that uh, is, is more effective at combating the, the climate swings that you get uh, in a city like Chicago. Critics over time have preferred 86880 as a sort of pure expression uh, of structure and cladding. That's all fine. I would argue that these buildings actually are, are more impactful in the way that they synthesize all of these elements and provide a, a model for post-war residential construction uh, especially, right? Thousands and thousands of high-rise apartment buildings are built like Esplanade, 86880, because it's steel, because it's not air-conditioned, is really a, a, a one-off.
And 860, or 900, 910, and 860, 880 are both very influential in the way that they uh, treat the, the expression of the technology. Structure and cladding in the case of Mises' earlier apartments, uh, cladding and environmental systems in, in the case of his later apartments. Um, inland steel, which we looked at uh, earlier when we were looking at, at, uh, at the curtain wall, um, is absolutely influenced by these. There's an early scheme by Walter Netsch that you see on the left that has a double glazed skin, and in between those two skins rises uh, a, a mechanical system that brings air uh, not on the inside of the glass, but between the two surfaces of the glass to supply uh, air to the offices within. Whether this would have worked or not, we don't really know, but that separation of the building skin from the structure, I think, is something that comes uh, out of the same issues that are, uh, are driving uh, Esplanade Apartments. There's a shift in designers at SOM when Netsch uh, leaves the Chicago office in 1954-55. Bruce Graham takes over, uh, and as you can see on the right, he keeps the basic scheme but simply eliminates that second skin on the outside. And we get the kind of synthesis uh, of structure and, and cladding that, that inland steel in particular uh, is famous for. These columns that are outboard of the, of the main offices, um, a, a, a cladding system that like 86880 uh, alternates the structural bay with the cladding bay. And as we also talked about, a, a, a system of uh, supplying air and services that celebrates them architecturally, right? That pulls the core with the elevators, all of the ductwork, all of the plumbing uh, out and makes it into a sculptural uh, presence. Inland Steel, though, also has a number of uh, structural innovations that, are, that become really, really important. Because the columns are pulled so far outboard, uh, they're about, uh, they have about a 55-foot span between them, um, there are real lateral uh, problems in the, in the short direction. And a young graduate student uh, engineer named Fosler Khan uh, basically auditions at SOM by solving the problem, by coming up with uh, a moment connection between these outboard columns and the deep girders uh, that are spanning the offices uh, that gives the building the rigidity it needs uh, against wind. His solution is here on the right. Um, you can see the girders, the 36-inch girders, framing into the, the columns, which are made of uh, basically two wide flange shapes superimposed on one another. And where those two intersect, uh, Kahn designs a welded uh, torque box. This is his term for it. You can see the, the kind of tabs continuing the, the flanges of the girder through the section of the, of the column. That takes place right here. And what that does is it creates a very, very rigid, stiff moment connection, very much like the ones we saw in 19th century uh, buildings like the Reliance that allows the frame itself to take on the lateral resistance, right? The, the, to, to resist uh, the wind forces uh, that, that, that it has. Here you can see in plan, this is really the, the problem. The core has a lot of diagonal bracing, a lot of stiff connections that gives that end of the building its rigidity. It's the north end of the building up here where the lateral problem becomes really acute and where these torque boxes uh, have to do the work of making the frame actually brace itself. Um, Graham details the curtain wall in a way that um, really weaves together the, the structure and the cladding so that the building kind of reads both as a glass box and an expressed frame. On the interior, uh, what all of this does is it gives the office this huge long span open structure that in turn allows the mechanical systems and the fluorescent lighting above to be spread out most efficiently uh, over the, the office floors. And this, in fact, this office shot is actually of SOM, which moved into the Inland Steel office uh, after it opened in 1957. That recipe of glass curtain wall and express structure is one that SOM continues in its other work in Chicago, but also elsewhere. Uh, here in New York, Chase Manhattan Bank is sort of inland steel blown up to bigger proportions. Uh, New York at the time allowed a uh, taller building than, uh, than Chicago did, although Chicago revised its code as well. Uh, 
And you see the same kind of formula inside as well, where there are uh, ceilings that have an active, uh, what Rainer Bannon would call a power membrane. So all of the lighting, all of the mechanical services are, dis are deployed in the void of the ceiling, which has open web trusses that allow the, the ductwork to sort of sort itself out. Lightweight partitions that can be reconfigured at a moment's notice. And as you can see, all of those spaces have access both to fluorescent light and to uh, a mechanical supply uh, and exhaust. On the right, you see the expressed structure, the same cladding recipe as the inland steel. The, the uh, cladding grid and the structural grid are, are integrated, uh, and this creates uh, a, a sort of holistic expression of what Bruce Graham, SOM, and in this case, Gordon Bunshaft thought of as the, the recipe for the, uh, the, the commercial skyscraper. That's not to say that's the only way to do it, though. And SOM's Chicago office in particular was inventive about thinking in terms of materials, thinking in terms of systems, trying experiments to see what the, what the most economical but also the most uh, impactful architectural expression could be. Um, here, just a few years after Inland Steel, Bruce Graham completely reverses the, the formula. He uses concrete uh, as the main structure uses a flat slab in a commercial building, which uh, doesn't really gain him uh, much in the way of height because you still need the, the mechanical services uh, down below. And now instead of cladding the exterior of the building, he adopts a very simple aluminum storefront system that just spans from slab to slab. Um, Hartford Plaza was a purely speculative building, so the economics of it were really critical. Graham argued that this was cheaper to operate because it didn't require an exterior window washing system, right? The, the inset curtain walls or inset storefronts could be cleaned by maintenance crews who could walk along the edges of the, the exposed slab. Also interesting, though, is that Graham talked about this building uh, as a, a, an homage to Robert Maillard, right? Remember when we talked about the beamless slab, we looked at the kind of narrow mushroom columns uh, that Maillard pioneered. And you can see a shape that looks very much like those here, that takes the additional shear stress where the slab and the column uh, interact and sort of celebrates them, right? Turns them into what little ornament uh, or, or, or kind of formal flourishes uh, the building has. Um, Hartford Plaza kind of proved that the concrete was at least competitive uh, with steel. Uh, and, and Graham would go on to design um, with Fosler Khan, a number of buildings that, that, that really uh, took advantage of this, that exploited either the, the steel or the concrete frame. Um, they uh, also adopted Mises' sort of minimalist uh, palette, so that when a structure is expressed or pulled out, uh, Graham details the curtain wall to kind of fade back so that all you see uh, is the structure itself. And this is maybe their most, their purest uh, expression of the, the structural frame. This is Graham working with Fosler Khan uh, to do a 20-story a, a, a building outside of Kansas City. And here you can see that the frame is clad in such a way that um, it, it really speaks very quietly about the, the combination of long span or longer span office space uh, and high rise construction that was becoming the sort of typical uh, commercial formula. As buildings get higher and higher, though, they, of course, face greater and greater uh, wind problems. And after Chicago liberalized its uh, zoning code in the late 1950s and allowed taller and taller buildings, uh, the market in Chicago, encouraged by a, a city government that wanted to focus uh, on downtown, um, began to build buildings that uh, started to exceed the, the height that you could very easily brace uh, with simple frame construction. And this led Fosler Khan and Bruce Graham in particular uh, to seek out other ways of structuring buildings, other ways of taking uh, the wind load on board that would lead to one of the few really revolutionary structural developments uh, in the, in the post-war era. And we'll take a look at that uh, in the next, uh, next piece of the lecture.